Hello again and welcome to part 3 of our Upgrading the Red Komodo series. This episode we'll be looking at batteries, recording media, monitoring and audio. If you haven't, make sure to check out the other two videos in this series, links to which are in the description below. Anyway, let's start off looking at what media options you have available. When it comes to recording media, the Komodo uses CFast 2 which has become very common over the past few years in cinema cameras. Using a third party media type is a first for RED and is an attempt to make the cards more affordable for the market the Komodo is aimed at. Pricing compared to their proprietary mini mags on their DSMC2 line is so much better. A 512GB RED CFAST2 card costs just £450 XFAT, whereas a 480GB mini mag will set you back £1150. RED has a list of approved media on their website. This includes their own 512GB which is co-branded with Angelbird, However, on here you also have options from ProGrade, SanDisk, Angelbird, Sony and XSend. When it comes to what size card you should grab, I would say the largest possible at your budget as the larger cards are more often more reliable than the lower capacities. When it comes to third party CFast2 card readers, if you don't want the red branding, the Angelbird reader is a little bit cheaper and will perform the exact same. ATEC also makes some great readers and even a quad bay reader designed for Thunderbolt 3 where you can choose which media slots you have in the array. Prograde's and SanDisk are also red approved, so grab whichever one fits your budget and your workflow needs. One thing we ran into was how hot CFast2 cards can get. We use tape to mark our cards sometimes, and during the production of our last Komodo video, one of our cards got so hot that the tape loosened up and then caused the cards to get stuck in the camera. So if you do this to your cards, just be careful because they do get very hot. Another option you could use for media is the solid pod. We looked at this a while back for the C200 and since then they have tweaked a few things with several different versions now being available. The benefit of the solid pod is the cost. Just bear in mind that while it does work with the Komodo, the solid pod is not a red approved accessory. So while this isn't something we would recommend, you could use it at your own risk. The solid pod itself comes in two versions, the plus and the slim, both of which are $199. The main difference being the width of the SSDs you can use. I would suggest picking up the plus out of the two as it also allows you to plug it in via the USB-C output, which technically makes it a reader too. You can then pick up a large off-the-shelf SSD such as the Samsung 860 EVO, which a 2TB version of costs just £260. Compare this to the price of CFast where two 1TB Angelbird CFast 2 cards and a USB-C reader come to just over £1900. That's a huge difference in cost. However, the downside of the solid pod is that it isn't approved red media. You have to remove the CFAST door as you can't close it, and you have to mount the SSD module onto your rig somewhere, which may be annoying depending on your shooting scenario. You are also adding several points of failure over a straight CFAST card. So for very crucial footage where your environment is unpredictable, damaging the solid pod may not be a risk you'll want to take. The Komodo really needs a monitor as the screen on the top of it is way too small to actually monitor an image. There are a few decent options on the market currently and some that can control the camera as well and others that can't. If you want to control your camera via your monitor, you currently have only a couple of options. If you want a small 5 inch for it, SmallHD did make their focus series which could control the Komodo but these have been discontinued. This means if you want a SmallHD monitor for your Komodo, you have to pick up either the Indy or Cine 7. However, if you really have your heart set on a 5 inch monitor, Portkeys have released the BM5 Mark III which features a full HD display with a peak brightness of 2200 nits and can control your Komodo once the cable comes out for it, all at a pretty decent price point. Portkeys have also released the BM5 Mark III WR, which is the same monitor but can control the Komodo wirelessly. The build quality is solid of both these monitors and the image is pretty good too. They can be powered via MPF or by a separate source using the aviation ports DTAP cable that is included in the box. We want to produce a video looking at the Portkeys BM5 Mark III WR a bit more in depth, so let us know if you're interested in this in the comments below. Other than the BM5 Mark III, the next best option really is the TV Logic F5A, which is a big step up in price. So a decent 7-inch monitor may be worth a look at if you don't mind the form factor. Atomos have just released their Shinobi 7, which looks to be a really solid option if you're looking at 7-inch monitors. It features a Full HD IPS panel with a peak brightness of 2200 nits, HDMI and SCI inputs and outputs with the ability to cross convert, all at a pretty decent price point. We'll be taking a look at it in a video soon, so make sure you're subscribed for that. 
However, a seven inch monitor can be quite large if you are planning on using it mounted directly on top of the Komodo, but this will be personal preference. If you are wanting a monitor that can control the Komodo, Small HD still offer their control kits for the Indy and Cine 7. With the Komodo's small form factor, it is unlikely to see the use of EVFs. However, users will have the option of using a SDI based viewfinder such as a Zacuto Radical Eye or Chameleon or Portkeys' OI. However, power and mounting would be a concern. Zacuto makes quite a nice little solution for using an EVF. This uses their Axis Micro to mount directly onto their cage. If you are wanting to use it more handheld and with shoulder use, you can use their regular Axis Mini with a top handle. Faxis have already shown off their Atom 600 KV, which doubles as a wireless transmitter and VLOC adapter which could be a very good choice to keep size and weight down. It has a very small form factor and adapts the dual BP plate on the back of the camera to a single V-mount, so mounting and power isn't an issue. As the plate also features a SDI and HDMI out, you can convert or loop out your SDI input in case you need to output to a monitor on camera. Axtune Cine 2S could also be quite a handy tool for Komodo users, as it can act as a Wi-Fi extender, which you can still use with the RED control app, which is pretty cool. Another thing you also may want to check out for the Komodo are Freakshow HD's 12G SDI reclocking DAs. Freakshow makes a range of these, but the most common recommendation for the Komodo is probably going to be their 1x2. This little unit is a compact reclocking distribution amplifier with a single 12G SDI in and a dual 12G SDI output. This could look similar to a splitter, but because it's a DA, it means these units will suffer from less signal dropouts and allow you to do longer cable runs. The 1x2 can come with either a DC or 2-pin Limo power input, so it's easy to power and could be really handy if you need a solution like this for outputting two well-synced outputs. The 12G SDI port on the Komodo is inherently susceptible to being damaged, like any SDI port is. But 12G ports are even easier to damage, so there are a few ways to help prevent this. Red have done articles recently talking about how to prevent damage to your SDI outputs via some best practices, so let's go over some now. Make sure to use high quality shielded BNC cables and only use shielded power cables for powering SDI accessories. Make sure the power is connected to the SDI accessory before you connect the BNC to the camera. Ungrounded power from SDI accessories can damage the camera's SDI port. To avoid this possible damage, attach the power source to the accessory before attaching it to the BNC cable. When using RED approved third party battery plates, unplug BNC prior to hot swapping. If you can, it is better to avoid P or DTAP cables to power accessories. To avoid damage when using these, it's important that you connect and disconnect them in a very specific way. When you are attaching SDI accessories, connect your power source to the SDI accessory, then power on the SDI accessory. Then ensure a power source is connected to the camera, and this ensures both are grounded prior to connecting the BNC. The camera's power state does not have an impact on SDI attachment sequence. Connect the BNC cable to the accessory and then to the camera. When detaching an accessory mounted to an SDI output, ensure that you remove the BNC connection to the camera before removing power to the SDI device. So shut down the SDI accessory, disconnect the BNC cable from the camera, disconnect the power source from the SDI accessory. When you need to swap out a battery that is powering an accessory that is connected to the camera's SDI port, you must shut down the SDI accessory, disconnect the BNC cable from the camera, Replace the battery on the SDI accessory. Connect the BNC to the camera and then power on the SDI accessory. If this is something you really want to help prevent, it may also be worth picking up an SDI galvanic isolator. Len makes a range of these, but you'll need to make sure you grab one that is designed for 12G SDI. These isolators provide isolation of DC currents between two pieces of equipment without degrading the signal. Even using a DA in your SDI chain, like the Freak Show units we talked about earlier, that's powered by the same source as your camera, can also help. It won't grant the same level of protection as an isolator, but you are far less likely to cause damage with one. So you essentially would never disconnect the Freak Show, keeping the BNC between it and the camera plugged in at all times. When it comes to the preamps, the Komodos aren't actually too bad. However, there are a few audio accessories that may be pretty handy. The Tentacle Tracky audio recorder is an awesome way to record timecode synced audio with the Komodo without adding loads of bulk onto it. The Tracky can be used with Tentacle's existing Synky generators, which you would then have sat on the camera, plugged into the timecode port provided by any of the expand units we spoke about earlier. 
Because this uses 3.5mm, we have created a custom Komodo 5 pin timecode to 3.5mm cable, which you can find in the description below. The track key can then sit wherever you need it to be, whether that is on talent or off talent plugged into a powered shotgun microphone, as it doesn't support 48 volt phantom power. You can then pair these two units via Bluetooth to your phone and set your timecode and you're synced. One other huge feature is the addition of 32-bit float audio recording. And this essentially captures a massive range of volume, so in post you can bring all of what you would normally be clipped or lost in the noise floor back by normalizing it in a program like Audition. It really is a revolutionary feature, and if you're a solo operator, it could be really handy if you don't have a sound operator on set with you. This is probably the most stripped down option for getting good quality synced audio on Komodo, and with 35 hours of battery life and the ability to power it via USB-C, it will be easy to power on camera. It's also really easy to mount on cameras because it's very lightweight and Tentacle also produce a range of mounting brackets for it as well. The BeachTech DXCA Red is a compact and tough dual XLR adapter with good quality preamps. It will also allow you to use your regular pro-grade audio equipment to provide 48 volt phantom power for resolving it into the good quality preamps of the DXA and then into the Komodo's 3.5mm mic input. You can power via the micro USB or the 2-pin Limo port on the back of the unit. These options give you flexibility on how you rig and power the unit. DXCA Red comes in at around £350 XFAT, which is pretty good considering the quality of audio you can pull from this. However, if you want to make a little bit more versatile, the Sound Devices Mix Pre 3 might be worth investing into. It is a little larger, but it also is much more fully featured and does feature 32-bit float audio that we mentioned earlier. I've seen people rig this up onto their cameras or record externally using timecode that we mentioned earlier to get nice synced audio. As we mentioned earlier, the Komodo uses Canon's BP battery plate. And this is the same as the original C300 or C100, not the BPA that the C300 Mark II and Mark III use. This means that the batteries are relatively affordable and well sized. Canon official ones are very hard to get hold of currently, but perform very well, passing through full information so you can see the remaining percentage, and they also charge on the back of the camera when you plug it into mains. There are several third party options, but we have only tested the Hawkwoods DV and Blue Shape variants currently. The Hawkwoods perform well, but currently don't pass through percentage information, just voltage. Blue Shapes sit in between the Hawkwoods and Canon when it comes to pricing, but are also hard to get hold of. However, they will pass through percentage like the Canons. Red also have Red Volts available for Komodo 2, and with them being made by Red, these will work flawlessly. Shape has also started making BP batteries, but we haven't had a chance to test these, so we're unsure whether they give battery readout or not. BP batteries are great for lightweight rigs and having the ability to hot swap them is really handy. However, there is a range of V-Lock or gold mount solutions that could fit your needs better if you are looking to use larger batteries or power a range of accessories on your camera rig. We'll be looking at offerings from Corswix, Wooden Camera, Tilter, Anton Bauer and Vaxis. Let's start off looking at the core plate. This plate mounts directly onto the back of the camera using the BP mounts, leaving the camera's DC input available for AC power and battery hot swap. When you use this plate with smart batteries that use SM bus data like Corswix's own batteries, the camera will read battery percentage and runtime providing accurate remaining battery capacity info. It features a PTAP output, one USB and a two pin LIMO output. This lack of outputs could be an issue if you are really trying to rig up your camera. Say for example, you want to rig your Komodo with a Nucleus Nano, Teradek, EVF, monitor and a beach tech. That will require five power outputs to power everything from the plate. If it just had one more output, this could be possible, though you could use a DTAP splitter as a solution to this. I really like how flush it is onto the Komodo. It's almost like an extension of the camera, which is what you want if this plate is going to live on the camera pretty much all the time. Currently, Core only has a V-mount option, which works really well with their nano micro batteries. Tilt have also made a similar plate to their advanced module that we mentioned in a previous video. This mounts onto the back of the camera using both BP slots and is available in V or gold mount. It features a 5 volt USB port, two D-taps and two 2 pin Limo outputs. This is a good amount of IO and will make powering a good range of accessories easy. You can't move the orientation of this plate like you can with Tilter's advanced plate we mentioned earlier. Currently, because this isn't red approved, you will not get time remaining readout on camera, just voltage. There are people who've had issues with the build quality of this back plate, so this doesn't seem to be the most solid solution out there. Winning Camera also offers their Battery Slide Pro. This can come in either V-Lock or Gold Mount and uses one of the BP battery slots to attach the camera and then a cable going into the DC port. 
They've designed it this way so you can also use their B box in the other BP slot, which is a really nice configuration if you need the extra inputs and outputs. Alternatively, you could use their BP battery, which will allow you to hot swap your batteries. However, for this, you will need their extension hinge to do it. The plate features three DTAP outputs, which when paired with a battery with its own outputs, means that you will be able to power a good amount of accessories. However, if more than 5.8 amps are used by accessories, a digital fuse will trip and the red LED will illuminate, but the camera will remain powered on. The reset button can be pressed once to restart accessory power. Ignite Digi has released a new power backplate for the Komodo, which uses DJI's fantastic TB50 batteries. With Ignite Digi starting out designing accessories for the gimbal world, they have created some really great accessories around DJI's TB50s, which are used to power the Ronin 2 and Inspire 2, and are fantastic batteries. With the Komodo being the size it is, it makes more sense that people will most likely be flying it on a Mobi Pro over a Ronin 2, and Ignite Digi make an adapter to use the TB50s on the Mobi Pro. So for owners of the Mobi Pro and Komodo, this could unify the batteries across them both. It also looks well put together and provides a range of power inputs and outputs. This is a very specific solution, but could be great for people who have an existing set of TB50 batteries and a Red Komodo. So that was our third and final part of the How to Upgrade the Red Komodo series. We hope this series has helped you understand some of the options available for your camera, but if you'd like some more tailored advice when it comes to your kit, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us via the details below. Let us know what other content you'd like to see from us about the Red Komodo and what your dream Komodo rig is in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching.